Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Dominique Cummings, and it is my pleasure to facilitate today's lesson, lesson number six, and our quarterly, and it talks about laying up treasures in heaven. Um, some administrative stuff. We had a quiz last week, and our winner is Shirley English. Um, and the way that we reward the quiz winners is quarterly. And there's a $50 card that is given to the person who answers the most questions on the quarter. So get your answers in and make sure that you win so you can get that prize. Before we begin the lesson, I want to thank my panel. And I want to offer a word of prayer. So if you will, bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for bringing us here safely. We thank you for your loving kindness. Let your spirit guide us through this lesson. And let us all be edified, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So this lesson is laying up treasures in heaven. And it talks about people who had laid up treasures not on earth, even though they had earthly treasures, but they laid out their treasures in heaven. The memory verse is, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. In the introduction to the lesson, it talks about how Jesus gave a strategy when he told that verse not to lay up treasures in, on earth that rust and that can be destroyed, that can be stolen, but to lay out treasures where moth, rust, or thieves cannot destroy. And Jesus also says where our treasure is, so there will our hearts be. I'm wondering today, where is your heart? Where do you lay your treasure this morning? As we discuss this lesson, we really hope that you will be edified as we will be and that um, change will occur in our lives to help us to do what God has asked us to do. My first question in this lesson is for um, Elder English. And it states, how should Christians value material possessions when viewed in the light of delayed gratification? What is the lesson learned from Noah? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, so first of all, Madam Moderator, and I know that, I know that the, the lesson uses uh, uh, Noah as a pivot point for this, for this question, but I have an issue with using Noah, right? And the lesson towards the end, they, they talk about it, right? Uh, in the last couple of sentences there, because, you know, Noah had a direct commandment from God, command from God, right? Go and build this ark. So whatever you got to do, you got to get this ark done. God's going to provide some resources. You may have to use your resources, your money and so forth. And you're going to spend the next hundred years or however long it took to, uh, to build this thing. He had a specific directive from God. Same thing with, um, you go back to Abraham, right? He had a specific directive from God to go kill this son whom he loved and waited a hundred years for to go kill his son, sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. If God tells you specifically to do something, my, my, sub, my suggestion is that you do it, right? And whatever it takes, you go ahead and do it. Now, if we back it up from a little bit with this concept of delayed gratification, we are promised streets of gold, right? We're promised mansions and so forth. So this concept of delayed gratification, uh, the way I receive it and the way it's expressed is that we don't need to lay up our treasures here and sacrifice this greater treasure. Because there are a lot of, a lot of rich people here on, in, in the earth and in, in the United States, even here in Miami, I don't think many of them have streets made of gold, right? So there is something that is greater for us that is waiting on uh, the other side, as it were. Now, what does that mean in terms of, mo uh, in terms of money? My wife and I were getting into it with this, with this lesson and this question this week, because, you know, let's say that in Miami, uh, you need $50,000 to live, right? For a family of four, you can get a little apartment, uh, I told my wife, I said, why do we need three bedrooms? We can go down to two bedrooms. 
He said, we got two kids. So like plenty of kids have, you know, bunk beds and they live. We can get a two bedroom apartment in the hood and give the rest of our money away to the church and to, um, and to uh, nonprofit organizations. And there are some people that live like that. There's this concept called effective altruism where some people, they will say, all I need is $35,000. I make 200, I'm gonna give every last other penny away. That's what they are convicted to do. I don't have that personal conviction. And I don't think God requires all of us to live that way in a poverty lifestyle. Um, he blessed, he blessed, uh, he blessed Noah. He blessed um, my boy with uh, with whose family. He blessed Abraham. He blessed David. He blessed Solomon. He blessed um, the Job. That's what I'm thinking of, right? A lot of people in the Bible. And none of them were were directed with that blessing to give it all away, right? So God expects us to be able to, to be willing to give it away. Just like the rich young, rich, rich young ruler that came to him, well, God, follow, what do you do? And he followed commands. I do. What else? Well, give it all away and follow me. He's like, oh, I don't know about all that. You have to be willing to, to, to give it all away. And that's where I think the rubber hits the road. If it comes to that time where you're willing to sacrifice streets of gold for a little house here in Pinecrest or Miami Beach, whatever the case may be, then I think we, we, we run up against a hard wall. Amen. And, and the Bible says in Genesis 6, 5 that Noah found grace from God. And in spite of everything that was happening around him, in spite of the culture of the day, the decadence and the degradation of the day, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God chose him to fulfill his purpose. But it's not just Noah that benefited from it. His wife his sons and his daughter-in-laws also benefited from it. So our obedience has cascading effects on our family. And just as Noah found grace, we too, if we obey God, will find grace and our obedience will cascade down to our family. Amen. Thank you, Elder English. <clears throat> Brother Cummings, we go to you for the next question. Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness, and through him all the nations of the earth are blessed. How must we react to God's command, and how do we teach our children to follow God's plan in this here, now, mind culture? How does our behavior impact their faith? Okay, as we continue with, with Abraham, with, with Abraham, we can see his obedience was a thing of practice. Sometimes, you know, we wonder how people could do certain things. Is you have to practice. We see what the, in Genesis 12, uh, 1 to 3, God told him, get, get thee out. All right? So, see, again, he was able, he, by faith, he moved when God said move. We see before Abraham had heard God's voice also, his father had moved, moved him moving to another, another country as well, you see? And Abraham had a life of, of, of obedience, okay? Upon seeing that, we see that um, he was able to move, because he had, his eye was looking at the, at, at the heavenly thing. The, the, as, he, as he said, the, the other things are temporal, temporal. These things are just here for a time, new car, new house, you know, clothes and so. These are just temporal things, you see? But we know that in heaven, it's a great, it's something greater for us. So his eyes was always on what God had for him in the future. And if we can do the exact same thing, now our kids now would see in us if we can have that faith to trust God. As we can, as we can see with, uh, with Abraham's son, Abraham's son was obedient to his father as well, you know. When he had to go and offer him up on the, as, a, as a sacrifice, he, they went up together. His son obedient, obediently went up on the altar again of sacrifice. What a, what, a, what a case that is. A young man, he could, have, he could have rebelled against that. But because of his father's uh, example, his son was, was willing to know what happened. If that's the dude, God will make a way somehow. And we saw that God made a way. So the lesson for us is this. We have to first set the example. That's, number, that's our key point, be an example. We have our kids, yes. We can't say one thing and do something else. And that's what kids don't like at all. We must set the example. We are going to say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, and move on in faith. And with God's help, you can see um, Abraham's obedience on questioning was a way of life. And maybe the same for us as we go through this Christian walk. 
may God help us. Uh, it's very interesting to note too that um, when you talk about faith, you said faith without works is dead. Right, right. And um, faith alone is not good. You must have works to accommodate faith. And you, you could do also have much work, do a lot of work, a lot of service, and don't mm -hmm. have faith. It's still dead. Right, right. And in order to lay up our treasures in heaven, we must have both. You can't have one with the other. You must have faith, and accompanying faith, you must also have works. Right, exactly. Yes. Hmm? And, and along with Darren saying, I, um, you know, oftentimes the work God asks you to do, or the things he's requesting you to do, you can't do it within a, of yourself, right? So I think it, it, it almost requires that level of faith. You know, if God says go start a new business or, you know, go preach in, you know, a different country or whatever the case is, like, you're thinking, man, I don't, I don't know if I can even get that. So I think, um, you know, I, li I like the fact that when God gives you something, it's not something that you can just accomplish within your own strength. Right, you literally right. have to depend on him, you know? And I, I, I think that that's great because Abraham was told he was going to be the father of many nations. Right. And, mm -hmm. and he had to really believe that in order to accomplish the, the objective that God had for his life. Amen. We, we can see also to a great point of faith when um, Peter, when, when God, Christ told him to walk, come, he stepped out in faith and he was walking on the water. See, that's, that's a lot of faith he had to put out there to do that. Come out of a boat and go to go Jesus Christ. That's the best faith to his highest point. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes um, the, the behavior is contrary to what faith requires, and that's the attitude of Lot. So, Adley, please tell us, how are Christians to use Lot's example mm -hmm. when in the process of making life-altering decisions? What was Lot's method for decision-making that brought him to such a terrible choice? Uh, great question. Um, and I'll just dig right in. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, that Lot was a righteous man, and his soul was vexed because of the wickedness in the city of Sodom. And that's taken in 2 Peter verses 2, verse 8. Uh, 2 Peter yeah, chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, he was a godly man living in an un ungodly place because of his own choosing. He had witnessed the same call as Abraham, but wanted to belong to the world more, more than heaven. Lot had the spiritual blueprint. He understood the blessing, but was blinded by his desire for worldly things. Lot was laying treasures in temporary things instead of the eternal, thus allowing himself to be tempted by the world. So in Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 12, it tells us that Lot looked and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan and it was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 and 12 tells us. It also says that Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and set out towards the east. And the two men parted company. And Abraham looked in the land of Canaan while Lot lived, Lot, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. So I think the first lesson we can learn from Lot uh, experience is that Lot was more interested in what looked good instead of what was good. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, it says that uh, God promised Abraham the land of Canaan, but Lot left the promised land to go outside of the promise. So how many, how many times do we leave the promised land, the place that God has asked us to bless, uh, for some place outside? First, when making a decision, we need to remain under the promise unless God tells us to move we must, we need to remain where the blessing is. Right, right. Um, and I think not just, you know, I think like the Bible says, uh, Lot was godly, um, but I think God requires not just choosing him. We need to choose him in every aspect of our lives. This man had wealth with his, you know, uncle, and he took the wealth to Sodom where it didn't belong. And the Bible says when he left, he left with nothing. Um, and it's even with our health, right? You know, are we exercising? Are we walking? Or are we, you know, are we consistently sitting on the couch, you know, watching our favorite show or eating snacks, right? So I think, you know, Lot's choices led him to, 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 to go further and further away from Christ. So I think um, we need to focus on not what just looks good, but what is good for us. The second thing, Lot aligned himself with people and sin. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 12 tells us that Lot moved his tent to a place near Sodom. He placed himself in proximity to sin and the people that loved it. And before he knew it, he was in the midst of a people and living in the city instead of the outskirts where God wanted him to be. So we know how sin operates. It, it, it's not playing so, you, you know, you can just go play and it lets you go. It, like it keeps you, 
It takes you further than you want to go, keeps you longer than you're willing to stay, and it's going to cost you more than you're willing to pay, right? Um, so I think he, that, that's the first thing. Also in Genesis chapter 14, verse 12, it also says, Lot is living in Sodom and is captured by enemies. Abraham rescued him, but Lot, went, what, Lot still went back to the place where the Bible tells us that he consistently sinned against God. When making decisions, we need to ask God to open our eyes to see when he delivers us from evil and help us to get back to where he wants us to be. I have two more points. This one is probably the most important. Lot failed to see the blessing in the struggle. And I'll just kind of describe it because, um, you know, oftentimes God, him and Abraham were having, I guess, I don't want to say issues, but they, they were, there, was, there was beef between the herdsmen. But I think the herdsmen were the physical indication that Abraham was committed to God and Lot wasn't, right? Because if, how, how are your herdsmen fighting if the masters are not right? If the masters are right, you tell your herdsmen, hey, get it together. We got to move forward. So I think the herdsman situation was an indication that there was something from the perspective of Abraham as it relates to their commitment to God that created the tension in the first place. And I think there's a blessing in the tension. Instead of Lot staying under the blessing and figuring out what God wants me to do, sometimes we run away from the blessing or from the struggle that God is trying to teach us. Because sometimes it's the struggle that gives us the understanding or the blessing that God is trying to give us. Um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about so many different examples. How many kids, you know, are in a good family, right? It's not a toxic relationship, but you struggle. And instead of saying, hey, you know what, let me struggle and figure out what God is really trying to do, you run away from your parents. It's not a toxic situation. Why are you running from your parents? Let's figure out what's going on. Let's walk through Or there's some parents who don't talk to their kids. You know, they just kind of give up on them. And it's like, well, that's what the struggle is for. God is trying to, you know, grow us. And people leave jobs and and, and relationships and so many different things. So I think the point is that sometimes God calls us to work through uh, struggles instead of running from it. And the only way that we can know what God wants us to do is to ask him. We aren't wise enough to make those determinations on our own. The last point is that uh, when grace is extended, we must, respond to, we must respond to love and grace by choosing him. Lot had many chances to come back to God. He was captured. The angels came to visit him. He had opportunities after opportunities to come back under the promise, but he chose to continue living outside of it. Every day we live, God offers us the opportunity to choose life, to live under his promise, his protection, his provision. But, when, but we would rather choose our own green grass instead of the grass God has for us. So I think if Lot was here, he would say, choose life, choose God, because based on his experience, he had everything at his disposal. And the more I think about it, Lot wasn't even Abraham's biological son, but the way Abraham treated him, it was, it was impeccable. Right. I mean, you, you get captured because you were doing your own dirt, and your uncle was like, yo, let's go, let's go grab this man, because, you know, God extended him grace. So I think um, if, Lot, if Abraham can treat Lot the way he did, and he wasn't his son, how much more would God have blessed him had he stayed under the promise? Amen. Amen. And also, the point is that Lot never consulted God. When Abraham told him, choose where you want to go, instead of doing what he should have done, which is ask God, where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. He looked with his own greedy eyes and saw the money and the stuff that he could get out of Sodom. And he chose the better field, the better land, the better everything, and was very ungrateful towards his uncle who had given him everything that he had because he was an orphan. So we have to be mindful that we don't act with a, a heart of ingratitude towards God and towards those who do us good because in the end, it comes back to bite us and make us pay more than we wanted to pay for it. Also, too, sometimes um, we think because people who have money, they figure that they, they control the world, you see. But we see God in his mercy, you know. You know what happened? That's their heaven. But they don't want to go to my heaven. Therefore, you know what happened? Let them enjoy themselves uh, for, uh, for now. Because they don't, they don't want to give up. They want to do it their way. So therefore, okay, that's your heaven. I have a better heaven for you, but it's by choice. Unless they do it Abraham's way and look for a city whose builder right. and maker is God. Okay. We're going to uh, jump to question number four. And that's for everyone to, to just take a stab at. As a Christian, and this one talks about Jacob. As a Christian, a detour need not be our final destination. God always keeps his promises. What can we learn from Jacob's experience when we or our loved ones try to take control of our lives and bypass God's authority and sovereignty to hasten the fruition of his promise? Anyone want to take a stab at 
stab at it. So Jacob was a usurper. God had promised him from the beginning that he would be the inheritor of his father's blessings. Yet he couldn't wait. And he had to connive with his mom to steal the blessing that God had already promised him. But the redeeming factor is that when he ran away and met God on the ladder, he understood his condition and he wouldn't let go of God until God had blessed him. Did he come out unscathed? Absolutely not. He had a lamp for the rest of his life. But his soul was redeemed. So let's not look at people in their current condition and decide that it's their final destination. Because God has a way of meeting people in the darkest, deepest place and turning their lives around. If I can add, I think sometimes we... I mean, there are other examples of people rushing the blessing, right? Even if you look at the prodigal son, yeah. mm -hmm. he wasn't mature enough, uh, obviously, <laughs> to be able to handle whatever the amount of wealth that he got at that moment in time. And you know the, the results uh, of his uh, expenditures there and his uh, adventures. Um, so what God has for you, it is for you in due time. And sometimes you just have to wait and be patient and allow his time, his schedule to run. Um, so we see, we see God's mercy uh, don't care what, you can never change God's plan, you know? You were the one to do this and want to do that, but God has that plan for you. Like, just look, look at Jonah. Look what he said, I will not go and preach. And what, look what he did. But look, God still worked it out, and he ended up doing the, doing the exact same thing what God wanted him to do. So we can see with God, don't care what you do, think, or feel. God's way is the best way. Is it also interesting to note that... Um even though God, Jacob turned his back against God and he ran, mm -hmm. God never left him. Right, right. God ran with him too. It was at some point in Jacob's story or his life, he realized that God was still there and he turned to God. And it's, it just goes to say, no matter how things are bad or how we perceive someone to say, that's a bad child. Mm -hmm. He's a criminal. He's a murderer. You got to understand that while we're saying that, God never turned their back on that right, person. Right, right, right. He's always there regardless of to, 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 to bail us out of the situation that we're in. It is us to turn ourselves and say, Lord, help me. And it's at that point that when Jacob did so, he had that experience with the ladder. Mm -hmm. He had that experience. And then Jacob ended up growing to be, what, the, 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 his name was changed. God blessed him. To what, the Israel, children of Israel? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So so you Israel. just got to say that when you turn your life around, no matter where you are, where how, what you feel that is happening to you, and you turn your life around and look to God, there's always a blessing to follow. Amen. There's always a blessing Amen. to follow. Right, right. And Darren, while will you add it, the 12 years of home Bible education counteracted the many years of immersion and pagan culture and influenced Moses' choice and altered his life completely. As parents and mentors, what should we emulate in this lesson, according to Proverbs 22, 6, to counterbalance the pressures of this world? Um, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Moses' mother, Jacobet, laid up her treasure in the development of her child. Mm -hmm. She was hired by Pharaoh's daughter, to care for him. Jacobet had only 12 years to teach her biological son how to pray, trust, on, and honor God, to shape his character for a life of service. Years went by and Moses was brought up in the royal courts and taught the Egyptian laws and ways. He had all the riches and accommodations that came with being a part of a royal family. One of, the greatest, one of the greatest and wealthiest ancient nations. However, as Moses grew, he was not comfortable with how the slaves were being treated. One would say that his conscience, his conscience was making him uneasy. 
The influence of his mother in his early years remained with him. Mm -hmm. As parents, or you influence your child basic values such as religion, education, their, their views about society, and much more. The strong relationship you have with your child is more likely your child is more likely your child will seek your opinion and guidance as they mature. Today we see there are so many other influences in society that our children are exposed to social media and technology use, friends, school, and so much more. But as parents, our role, our job, our responsibility is to instru is, is, as instructed by God, is to train up our children in the Lord, to instill in them the biblical values so that they can make wise decisions when they grow up. Not to say that everything is going to be great mm -hmm. or that they wouldn't stray, but likely, but like the quote by Valamir Lane states, give me a child for the first five years of his life and he will be mine forever. Amen, yes sir. The behaviorist B.F. Skinner says, give me a child and I will shape him into anything. If possible, investing in your children, especially in the early, if possible, invest in your children, especially in the early years. The Catholic Church says, mm -hmm. give them your child in the yes. early years, right. and they'll be a Catholic for life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in my opinion, the Seventh-day Adventist Church should make Christian education free for all members. Amen. You know, because this is a very important part of structuring and developing mm -hmm. our children for the future because as stated even by those who are not of our religion the early years influence our children's character and so much more mm -hmm. so as parents relatives teachers mentors church members it is our responsibility to to do just like Jacobet the influence of our chi our children from young influencing our children from young even if we didn't have an opportunity to influence a child in the early years, we all know, even as adults, the influence that mentors play in the lives of a teacher who takes interest in us and the difference it makes. Never give up on your children regardless of their age. Just be positive influence them and leave the rest to God. Amen. That's it. Amen. Amen. Yes. Well said. Pastor Dutton, your last question is, by today's standard, Abraham was a multimillionaire, but the only thing he bought for himself was a tomb. How should we view the material, temporal things of life when our eyes are turned toward eternity? Well, thank you so much and happy Sabbath, everyone. And thank you for that question. Um, what got me is the fact that um, Abraham was a great planner. Um, he didn't leave his family without something for the future. And um, that, that goes to show that we also need to emulate that right. in the fact that we, uh, when we finally close our eyes, that there should be something there for our family. So I think Abraham was setting the tone there as a very wealthy man, but also a very wise man. Um, now, uh, the only thing that Abraham purchased was a tomb and for many individuals if not all in the world uh, we don't really want to talk or think about the time that we're going to die um, because we don't we, we're wanting Christ to come back before we die mm -hmm. but if Christ doesn't come we have to face the reality that we all have to walk the road to okay. death right. and in that we can't take the things of this life with us there was a, a gentleman who passed away but in his will, he put that he must have briefcases of his money to be placed in his casket. The challenge is that those who came to the funeral heard his request. They knew of it. And they saw that he had all this money in the briefcases in his grave, in his, in his casket. So in the nighttime, they went and they dug up the grave after he was buried, took out the briefcases because at the end of the day, he didn't need it. Right, right, right. You can't take money when you're, when you're dead. 
And Abraham was wise enough to know it. So he decided the only thing worthy is to focus on not this life, but the life to come. Amen. Right. And so uh, when I looked up, the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10 that Abraham looked for a city whose maker and architect or builder, some Good version life. says, mm -hmm. is God. Amen. So Abraham was not focused on this life. He was looking forward to the life to come. And that's what we have to remember. Money is going to, is going to go away. It's gonna, right. it's gonna, you know, a car is going to rust. Right. A cell phone is going to depreciate in value. Right. Right. Um, our house is going to have cracks, maybe even um, fall one day, yeah. or someone would decide after they buy it for a million dollars, yeah. would come in with a bulldozer and, raise and it down. break it down yeah. and build up something that they want to see. Mm -hmm. So we can't put all of our effort into these things in this life because they will fail. Amen. They will fade. They will rust. They will decay. And at the end of the day, the only thing that we have for surety is our connection with the Father. That's what Abraham knew, and that's why we have to put our effort, not in the things of this life, but in the things to come. And that's what Abraham is trying to teach us. Hopefully that answers the question, and thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And, and to conclude, we saw that Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, um, all followed God's precepts, all had their eyes based on the future. They were not looking at the here and now, but they were looking at eternity. Lot, who went differently and was looking at the temporal, lost his Everything. life. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's not uh, focus on the here and now. Let's plan for eternity. Let's build foundations in heaven. Let's not take all of our attention to the things of this world. Not to say that money is not important because all these people were wealthy. So a lot of people in the Bible have a lot of money, but their focus is not on their money. immediate uh, assets. Their focus is always on heavenly assets. So let's build our homes in heaven. Let's bring our children with us. Let's teach them in the young age that God is God and give them respect for God, faith in God, trust in God, obedience to God, and understanding for God. We thank you so much for, for, the lesson with, for having the lesson with us today, and we hope that you will answer the question of the quiz and be a winner. And at this time, let's just close with prayer. Father, we thank you that you allowed us to study your word. We pray that these lessons that we learn today about your people will imprint on us how to live our lives and how to live an inheritance for our children that rust and moth cannot destroy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, Tabernacle, and welcome to another Health Nugget. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about turmeric, and it's by popular request or by one of the members coming to me and asking me to just kind of reference that and ginger. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about turmeric. What is it? What is turmeric? It's a spice that comes from the root of the curcuma, curcumuna longa plant, which is a perennial in the ginger family. So it's related to ginger. It's, um, its most active ingredient is curcumin. It gives turmeric that yellowish color. And beware, if you ever get on your clothes, it does stain it, and it stains pretty easily. Now, what are the benefits of it? Um, well, there are quite a lot, and it's very similar to ginger. When I looked at the two of them, they're very, very close. Number one, it reduces inflammation. Um, there was a study done with chronic inflammation, uh, ulcerative colitis, those who have that. And they found that taking two grams of curcumin per day, or turmeric, it extended the time between active flare-ups. So if you were going to have a flare-up once every two months or once a month, it would, it, it, it would extend it to every four months, or, or if it was once a month, it would be once every two months. So it was um, amazing. It helped to extend the time that you felt better. So many people who have inflama inflammatory issues like this take, take um, turmeric. Um, it does improve your memory. And how does that work? Well, there's something called a BDNF factor that it helps to, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it helps increase that. And when that goes down, you, you have some loss of memory, or you, it's hard for you to, f to form long-term memories. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. But ingesting it 90 milligrams two times per day for 18 months improves cognition and memory in everyone except dementia patients. It didn't seem to make as much difference. So they don't really recommend it. If you have dementia, possibly it wouldn't hurt taking it, but the studies indicate it didn't make much difference, but certainly does for those of us who don't have dementia. And I'm saying us because um, I, you never know, okay? Um, it lessens osteoarthritis um, pain. Now, there's Unproven, proven versus unproven. This one study says yes, one study says no. And it's interesting, the same thing for ginger. But what I believe is that if it reduces inflammation, which it does, it must help. It, it, it's, it's obvious, it's got to help. So even though the study says something, I'm not sure how good that study was because I truly believe it helps. Uh, okay, so I think if taking it, if you have... Um, inflammation, joints, and so forth, it should help you. Now, it's also an antioxidant. It neutralizes the free radicals in the body. It has a synergistic effect with other antioxidants. What that means is this. If 2 plus 2 equals 4, if you have, you're taking one fruit and another fruit, and both of them combined will give you double the amount of um, um, antioxidant effect, 2 Two plus two with ginger gives you six or five. It gives you quite a bit more. So it, uh, it helps to take it with other antioxidants. So if you're taking it, take it with other things also. You know, your fruit or whatever. Um, it lowers the risk of heart disease. Um, and um, a, a study was done with um, individuals taking four grams of curcumin before and after surgery. And those who took it had a 65% lower risk of having a heart attack. So it is beneficial when taken with other medications, also in lowering cholesterol. So it has a lot of good benefits to it. And, and when you start to read it, you're saying, well, wow, I should be taking this stuff. You know, it's, it, it actually is very, very beneficial. Um, it lessens depression. Now... This is where we get to the brain-derived neurotrophic factor I was talking about, about the BDNF. The, it, that causes the hypo, when, when um, depression lowers that, and that causes the hippocampus to shrink. And curcumin 
boost that or the turmeric boosts that. And so it improves your learning and your memory. But it also increases the levels of serotonin and dopamine, so it, it helps to reduce depression. So at the same time, it's helping your memory, it's helping you to be less depressed. So it's a wonderful, wonderful um, route to take. It helps also to prevent cancer. Um, they did another study colorectal, with men with colorectal cancer, and they saw a 40% reduction in the number of lesions after taking it for a while, with treatment, of course. But there was a lot more reduction with the turmeric. All right, how much should you take then? The maximum recommended dose is about 500 milligrams twice a day. And you take it with um, heart healthy things like, like your oils, your avocados, um, the nuts and the seeds. It may interact with blood clotting medications, so they don't recommend it, you taking it if you're taking anything that, medications that will clot and um, affect your clotting. And those if, of you who have gallbladder disease don't take it. Um, it's, you need to avoid it. You need to exercise wisdom when you take any of these things. You know, you just can't just take them blindly. You know, um, the interesting thing, nobody's born wise but we develop it over time. And this is a symbol from Ghana, the, the Ashantis. It's called the wisdom knot. And so this represents praying for wisdom and achieving wisdom. You all have a great, great Sabbath.